Tell us about uh, 1993. Um, and I'll set it up in this way. As I started studying about the September 6th, it, it was easy for me to feel like you guys were victims. Like, oh, these people were just trying to do what was right. They were just trying to speak honestly and candidly, like you just said. I'm burning up back here. Some of us are burning up. Um, and so it's just easy to, to construct a narrative such that you're victims. But as I've gone back and listened to some of the speeches that were being given in 1992 and 93, I mean, they're bold. They, it, it almost felt like there was sort of a subtle plea saying, we're ready to take this next step. Bring it on, excommunicate us, and we feel like um, somehow, like Galileo suffering what he suffered, or Obi-Wan Kenobi being killed, somehow that made Luke more powerful and strong in the end. So I guess it's a two-part question. You know, were you anticipating that? Did you almost want it to happen? And, um, and what were you thinking would happen once, once the excommunications happened? Like if you had to project the timeline, 95, 98, 2000, mm -hmm. what did you see as the, as the storyline and even the positive fruits that might emerge? It's a big question, but you've got 30 No, minutes. yeah, it's, it's a good question, John. Um, certainly, I don't want to think of myself as simply a victim. To me, uh, you know, I, I, I never like these sort of false dichotomies. Either you're a victim or the uh, flip side of that that I hear all the time from church members is, well, you made a choice. It was just your choice. You, you could have stayed in the church. All you had to do was obey your leader and um, you made the choice. It had nothing to do with anybody else. It was your choice and you have to take the responsibility of that. So those are the two extremes. Either I'm this, this sort of the helpless little martyr victim, or I am, you know, oh, I made the choice and I just kind of merrily went on my way, right? And I have to do, accept the responsibilities. I think it's a much more complex picture of an interactive. And, and I see that even in terms of, as you said, the boldness and the rhetoric. You know, why did I become bolder? If you look at my 1984 speech, my first speech at Sunstone, versus the speech I gave in August of 1993 where I participated in a panel called If Mormon Women Have Had the Priesthood Since 1843, Why Aren't They Using It? And by that time, I had been given an ultimatum by my state president to say that I could not speak, write, publish, discuss anything to ch do with church history or church doctrine in any forum or they would hold a court on me. So giving the speech that I gave at that Sunstone Symposium was, in a sense, my choice that I was saying, no, I will not be silent. Okay? Now, I was still, there was a part of me that still hoped <laughs> that they would see that it was wrong to excommunicate me. But I think that I had accepted my fate by August of 1993. And that was the boldest statement that I had given to that point. And I think that, so in terms of your question about was there an escalation of boldness, I think that there are two reasons for the escalation of boldness. One of them is that you, first of all, you start feeling like you're speaking to deaf ears. So there's a frustration that built between, you know, the early 80s and the early 90s where you know you've tried the the private avenues you've tried to be reasonable you've you know given your good reasons why things need to be changed and you it's there seems to be no response and so it's sort of like you know if you use my analogy again of the person in the back of the bus you start shouting louder so part of the escalation or the the rhetoric that's rising is your frustration because you feel like you're not being heard. And it's sort of, it's silly on one level because you go, it's sort of like, uh, you know, when you're speaking to a foreigner that if you think if you talk louder that they'll understand you, right? <laughs> Which, of course, they don't. Well, I mean, it is true that I tried different ways of, of representing it. So you, you're, you're, you're increasing your rhetoric because you want to be, you want to be heard and you want to be clear and you want people to see how important it is. So that's part of it. 
The other part is that I think that up until I received the letter, which was the ultimatum where they said they were going to hold the court on me, I really did not think it was going to lead to excommunication because I just could not imagine that for myself. That was like this horror out here. It's like the way we can't really think about our own death, right? You know, we all know we're going to die, but we don't really believe it on a certain level. And that was how I felt about excommunication. When they gave me that ultimatum, I think that there was a part of me, I, I had to go through that very soul-searching process and say, I mean, my church membership meant a lot to me. So it was not something I did lightly. It, it took a lot of, of soul-searching to say, is this what I should do? Is it worth the price? Um, do Should I go ahead and speak? And I felt like I had to. For me, not to speak out was to participate in an abusive system, to go along with something that I saw was very abusive. And it wasn't, it wasn't because I felt like I had to talk about women in priesthood. You know, I could have been quiet about that issue. For me, the underlying principle was really the important thing. The underlying principle was what kind of a spiritual community do we have in the church? What kind of a, of a relationship do we have between members and leaders? And what kind of models? And that was the issue. So it was a conscious decision. I'm going to give that Sunstone speech. I'm not going to be quiet. I told the state president at the very beginning, I cannot agree to be quiet, not because I think that what personally I have to say is so important, but because the, the principle of freedom of belief and expression are to me so essential to have faith. I don't think you can have real faith if you can't explore your doubts. So there was that. Um, let me see if I fully answered you. So that was partly why the, 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 then I guess the other part of this, of the escalation, is that it's like being on death row. If you, if you are, if somebody is pointing a gun at you and saying, you know, be quiet or else, and you've decided that you can't be quiet, you're going to say the most radical thing <laughs> because you already know that you're going to get killed, right? So why, what do I have to lose now? Why be quiet now? So that was it. Then once that we, once Paul had been excommunicated and we were more or less labeled as apostates and out of the church, then since that time, even though originally I didn't have a lot of plans to keep writing, I have felt like I'm in a great position now. I've already been exed. I'm already labeled as a bad person and an apostate. Somebody's got to say the radical things. For the people who are in the church, they can't say it. So I might as well be a voice in exile because somebody needs to be that voice and I'm in the perfect position now that I can be that voice. So that was sort of the process, John. I don't know. Did I not answer oh, one of the good. parts of but the question? I'm going to ask you. I'm going to play devil's advocate for just okay. a second. Please forgive me. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 it's, that's it's, academia, right? Okay. Devil's advocate. Okay. Give me your hard question. Okay, so. Tell me I'm wrong. No. <laughs> so there's a, I don't want to call it academic, but, um, there's an intellectual argument that says women are inferior, that they're lower in the hierarchy, that they don't get to make the decisions, that, that the men rule, that the women don't have the priesthood, that they're not empowered. I can see all that. But then if you just totally forget, turn off your brain, and you just say, what's the average woman experiencing in the church in 1993? Mm -hmm. My mom, my mm -hmm. sisters, you know? They go to church, they serve in their calling, they raise their kids. Um, they're, uh, they have spiritual experiences, they bear their testimony, they have visiting teachers come, they have home teachers come. When their sprinkler system breaks, someone from the ward comes and helps them. They, get, they help raise their kids in a place where the kids get ethical nourishment and get a support system that helps them be healthy and successful in life. Um, you know, the women in my life, because they probably weren't academically inclined, have always felt very satisfied with Mormonism. Very, you know, it's not perfect and there are problems, but all in all, they've felt so grateful that the church has been in their life and that they've had these leaders and examples and experiences. So 
uh, I offer that as a contrast between the type of language that I hear in 93, that it's like the church is rotten from the core and there's apostasy and there's just these horrible things happening, which, which doesn't necessarily jive with what maybe even a good chunk of women in the church were experiencing. They were actually maybe quite fulfilled. No, and so I, how, I, how I no. You respond to that. I, I think that your question is excellent, and in fact, in my recent article, or it's more important than girls, I address that to a degree. But I think it's a very important question, and I have several responses to it. First of all, and I've always said this, I think the church does a lot of good. That there are wonderful things that happen in the church for both men and women and that gives so much meaning to people's lives, that help them with their everyday problems, that, you know, are really empowering. And of course, this is not just in the LDS church. Um, I also do research on women and religion in a larger context. And it, it's, if you look historically at um, women's position in various Christian or Jewish or Islamic you know, uh, communities, um, you always find a mixture. Religion in general is very empowering for women. And women receive a lot of not just meaning, kind of general meaning that everybody receives, but a sense of, you know, having a special place in God's plan um, that gives them a sense of purpose in their lives. It's religion, if you look at it just historically, religion has been empowering for women. At the same time, religion in Western culture is probably the biggest arena where they are second-class citizens. And this is a contradiction that you, you've got to deal with. If you're going to deal with this issue, you can't ignore, I don't think you can ignore either side of it. But there is so much, po so much empowerment and positive thing there's so many positive things that happen for women within religious communities. And again, that's not just in Mormonism, it's all over in religious communities. At the same time that religion has been, you know, with the secular world trying to give more equality to women, even now, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are three of the areas in Western culture where women are still subordinate to men. It happens simultaneously. So I, I grant that, and I don't I don't want to underplay the positive for women within religion, or that most women feel perfectly satisfied. And so I've done a lot of soul searching of, why should I try rock the boat when most women feel perfectly happy? And not only that, I could even give a further argument, John, that you didn't bring up. Mormonism has one of the, probably the highest activity rates for males of any religious organization in America. If they didn't have the priesthood, would that be true? And if we gave women priesthood, would suddenly that balance be disturbed in a way that would, um, I don't know, make it so that men lost their interest? You know, I mean, that's a real serious question. I, I don't say that flippantly by any means. Well, and as, you, as you read comments by Joseph F. Smith early on, uh, Gr Greg Prince actually um, showed me a 1907 speech where that's exactly what Joseph F. Smith said. He said, we've got these quorums, and we've got these leaderships, and we've got the hierarchy, but the brethren aren't on fire, you know, in the quorums. And so... Yeah, there, there's actually some historical evidence. That well, and you might them. say that after the 1970s, when you have correlation and the Relief Society has less power, that the men were empowered by basically taking the power from the women. So, you know, I have, I have a couple of responses to that, and maybe more than two. In terms of the priesthood issue, um, you know, I'm not a feminist that, that says that we should erase all differences. I think differences are very important to identity. Even if you're talking ethnic differences, those can be important to identity. Uh, I'm not one that wants all of us to be white, right? <laughs> or all of us to be a certain way. So I have argued, and you know, most people haven't read my 
you know, the specifics of a lot of the talks, but I have argued that if women had priesthood, that I think that you could have a women's priesthood and a men's priesthood and that they would function in some ways independently, in some ways uh, coordinate, and that my my desire would not be to erase all differences or that say everybody has the same job or anything like that. I think that again, you know, with revelation and creative thought that there are a lot of ways that you could handle that. So that's one response is that I'm I'm not one that wants to erase all differences and that I really feel as a feminist, I feel that keeping the um, keeping the um, Listening, going back to listening to people's experiences is very important. I do not believe that my feelings about the church are more important than, you know, some other woman's feelings about the church. I certainly don't believe that that is true. I think everybody's experiences need to be valued. So that's one part of it. And I agree that this is very complicated. There's another part of me, though, that says there's something really sick if the only way that we can keep men involved is if we tell them that they're going to be in charge and that somehow they have the special role that women can never have. You know, there's something very disturbing to me about that. It's almost demeaning to men, the idea that we have to coddle them or make them, make them, you know, make them, you know, feel a certain way. That there's that seems to me dysfunctional <laughs> on a certain level. I mean, so I, I know that I'm dealing with things that I don't think I've, I have all the answers to. How do we keep difference and the sense of individual identity and missions for both men and women at the same time that we have more equality? You know, I haven't worked all of that out. So I on the one hand, I acknowledge that your 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 concern is very valid. On the other hand, for me, it's a little bit like the race issue or like the handicapped issue. To say that, you know, you know, do we need to accommodate a minority of people because their needs are not being met with, with the disabled or I don't know what the politically correct term is now. You know, do we need to build the ramp that's going to cost money to let the person with the wheelchair up? You know, are there certain women who have been called of God? I mean, if you believe in revelation, and here's one of my points, if we believe in revelation, what does the revelation of women's priesthood in the temple mean? You know, I mean, if you're a non-believer, then maybe this doesn't matter. But if you're a believer in the faith of Mormonism, what does women's priesthood mean? And what would it mean to women's sense of self if they saw themselves, if we saw a woman? What, I mean, you know how much reverence is given to President Hinckley. What if we had a woman that was held in that esteem, that we said, here is a woman in the church who, she is a prophetess, and she speaks to God every Thursday, and she's going to give us the will of God. What would that do to women's sense of self and to what they can do and their potential? I guess that I'm bringing up that argument because on the one hand, while I acknowledge all these counter-arguments that you've made, I'm thinking that two things. First of all, what if it is a revelation of God that women should have the priesthood and we're rejecting that just like we rejected, I think we rejected the black members' rights, male members' rights to priesthood, and we damaged for a hundred and something years the, 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 we damaged the, the black members of the church for that long. What if it is a revelation of God? I mean, look at the, the RLDS, now Church of Christ. I mean, they have a female apostle. Everybody that is in that church says that's a great blessing to them. What are we missing out on? So my first thing, what if it is a revelation of God and we're just not receiving the fullness of blessings that we could have because we're not willing to ask that? And the second thing is, I think that there is more damage done to women's self-esteem in the church than we acknowledge. 
And just the fact that I see this at the University of Utah, that women do not feel as confident about their opinions, about their point of view, about all sorts of things. They defer to men. I see it all the time with my younger students. They'll defer to men. And I, we, haven't, we don't even see it. We're blind to it. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I don't say that I have to be right on this, but what if I'm right? So I don't think it's an easy question, an easy answer, John. And in some ways, I think the gender question is harder than the race question. To me, the race question is just so obvious <laughs> that we were prejudiced and we shouldn't be prejudiced because it damages and that all of God's children, no matter what race you are, we all have equal worth in terms of gender, the reason I think it's a little bit more, it's more difficult is that we do have different bodies. On the other hand, there's so much that we have in common and that those common things in terms of what priesthood is, I mean, this whole idea of women have motherhood and men have priesthood, I have to say that that argument really upsets me. Men have fatherhood. And to say that that the fatherhood is somehow not on an equal footing with motherhood. I mean, yeah, I know, giving birth, I nursed all my kids. That does mean something. It is different than men's experience. But priesthood is about spiritual fatherhood and spiritual motherhood. And by damn, I'll say it on tape, we need a spiritual mother just like we need a spiritual father. We need a heavenly mother just like we need a heavenly father. And to somehow in the spiritual realm create an inequality between men and women is so damaging, I think. You know, just as in the home, you need, I mean, you need a male and a female role model. I'm not saying that the nuclear family is the only one that works. We have a granddaughter that, you know, my husband is her big role model um, because my daughter is a single mom. But, you know, you... To, to, to say that we don't need these spiritual mothers in the church, and I don't think we have them. I'm sorry, we don't. I, I, don't, I don't buy that. That's one thing where I will just say, on the one hand, I to totally agree with you that the church helps women and that women are a valuable, contributing, important part of the church, and they do enormous amounts of service and good things. But there's a way, because they do not have the priesthood, that they do not have either the input nor do they have an image of themselves as the spiritual equals in the way that someone like President Hinckley or the Quorum of the Twelve is, and I think it damages women. What about this notion that we don't um, relegate Mother in Heaven to a lower status, but that we respect her so much that we, we choose to... I, uh, you know, I, I better not get into how much this upsets me. Um, well, let me give you an analogy. We don't talk about certain things in the temple because, in Mormonism, because we say they're sacred. But we have pictures of the temples all over the place. We have, we have, we talk about the importance of the temple. We talk about going to the temple. The temple, we temple, 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 is everywhere. In our images, our visual images, in our language, it's there. We are, we want to silence speech about Heavenly Mother. But when you silence speech, and I'm not saying that you always can say everything in every, in every forum, right? But to not be able to say the name of the Heavenly Mother, to not acknowledge that she has something to do with us on an everyday level, it erases her. It does not make her sacred. It erases her. I mean, another analogy would be, I mean, Mormons are very literal. I personally do not know really what the spiritual realm is like or what is literal and what is figurative. It's very hard, I think, for us to know you know, what are just simply metaphors and what is real about this realm that we have so little evidence of. So I don't know how much is literal. But if you use the analogy that Mormons talk about a literal Heavenly Father and a literal Heavenly Mother and there are parents, what would you think of a husband that told his kids that they couldn't talk about their mother 
or even talk to their mother on the phone because she was too sacred, that had locked her up somewhere and given no one access to her. I mean, in terms of this idea of the name being denigrated, I mean, I can't believe, I mean, as a mother, do I care even whether my kids, you know, if I had the choice between my kid is going to yell at me because my child is angry at me and my kid is never going to talk to me but be over there, would I choose to interact with them even if it's angry or not to interact at all? As a mother, I would want to interact with the kid. I mean, mothers deal in shit. If to be a mother is to be thrown up at, that the baby's diaper leaks all over you, you know, you can't be a mother without being shit upon. I will say it again. Because the idea that motherhood is sacred and so you have to be removed from dealing with any dirty problem, I mean, who are we kidding? You know? So if there is a real heavenly mother, she's willing to take the shit. You know? What kind of a mother wouldn't be? I mean, that's a real mother. That's what a real mother is. So it, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. For me, it is a mechanism of dismissing and erasing the Heavenly Mother, and I think it's horrible. I think it damages all, not just women, but men, because men need mothers and women need fathers, and we need to have good relationships with both. And, you know, from my perspective, you know what it means to take God's name in vain? To take God's name in vain means to use the name of God to force people to do things that are not really God's will. And to, you know, to, to say, you know, I, I don't think God is so petty. The God that created this large, complex universe is not shocked by the F word. I'm sorry. He's not and she's not. They're not shocked. They are bigger than this. I don't buy it, John. <laughs> what, what about the, um, and I'm setting you up another uh, um, softball to hit out of the park, but what about the argument that um, because it may not just be mother, it may be mothers, that that's just a little bit, we don't want to go there? Well, certainly I think the church is very nervous about polygamy. And theologically, I don't know if we have time to talk about this right now, that's a whole other topic, polygamy, right? And, you know, I don't know what the heavens are like. I certainly don't be believe in one heavenly father and multiple heavenly mothers. Maybe we have a council of gods with multiple fathers and multiple mothers. Um, but you know what? Even if the Brigham Young picture were true of one heavenly father and many heavenly mothers, we certainly shouldn't be forbidden to, I mean, think big love, right? Uh, It'd be nice to interact with all those mothers. We can all use a little more mothering down here, right? But I know the real issue is the church is embarrassed about polygamy and they don't want anything to come up that is going to have to make that issue public. Well, I do have strong feelings about this because I think that the church has, they're being cowardly in a way that is really unfair to members. Okay, do we believe in polygamy or not? Right now, our ceilings, I mean, I have a sister that died, and my brother-in-law just remarried when, a year ago and was sealed to that woman in the temple. So he now has two wives in the eternal world. And my nieces are dealing with the reality of that. Do they have two mothers in the next life? That troubles them. What the, you know, President Hinckley got up and said that we don't teach or believe in polygamy anymore, but our sealing practices say we do. That they're being, they're being, uh, they're not being forthright in a way that is damaging to the members of the church, my nieces who have to deal with this question. Do they have two mothers in the next life? Are both of these sealed to their father? So I think the church needs to take a stand on this. If they don't believe in polygamy, then say they don't believe in it. If they do believe in it, then they better explain to the women how it's fair. Because it doesn't seem very fair. And I don't care. You're talking about most women being happy. Most women may be happy with the present church, but most women I know are not very happy about polygamy being an eternal reality. And so the church 
had better be honest about this. What if they don't know? What if they don't They know? could say that. They could say that. They is, that could, is that realistic or fair to hope for? You know what? I th well, I don't think it's realistic, <laughs> but I think it's fair. I think that it would help a lot if the church said, um, but then they should change their sealing policies. It, I mean, right now, you know, a, husband, a woman, you know, if a woman wants to, you know, has a husband that dies and then marries again, you know, if she, she can't be sealed to both of them and say, well, I'll choose in the next world, you know, who knows what the next world will be, so I'll choose because I love them both, right? Well, of course, my brother-in-law, I mean, his feeling really is that he does have two wives in the next world. He loves my sister, he loves the new wife, right? But if they don't know, they should say it and they should have a policy that doesn't favor men over women. If they really are not sure, they say, well, it seems to be a revelation and we kind of don't want to just you know, backtrack on all those people that were sealed to multiple people because you know, that wouldn't seem right either. It's a, it would be a mess. But they could admit it, you know, that there are certain things we don't know, so we're going to try to do the best and I don't know. It, but at least you could be, you could admit that it's complex and a problem. And I don't think that would hurt people's faith. You know, there, there are certain things you could say we do know. I mean, we know that Jesus is our Savior and, and so forth. But, but there are other things we don't know. And, and we have to be open about those. And I think members of the church would be fine with that. Especially when it comes to what heaven's going to be like. You know, who knows what it's going to be like. So... I, I just think that we have to, that we could be more open about that kind of an issue.